Hey everybody, welcome back to Woodworking Wisdom. Um, my name's Colwyn and it's May the 4th if you haven't guessed already. So we thought we'd link today in for all these Star Wars fans a little bit of May the 4th fun. Okay, so we're going to do a little R2-D2 lamp. For anybody that hasn't seen the movie, um, I almost said go away, but no, please don't go away. Come back. Um, if anybody hasn't seen the movie, uh, R2-D2 is a little droid that uh, is in the film and just give you an idea of where we are. That's our little droid, a little lamp holder there. We're going to turn that into a lamp um, during the course of today's demonstration. Now, of course, there's many robots, if you want to call them, but droids, ships, and things like that in the movie. And um, that's not just where we have to stop it at our little R2-D2. If we just go overhead, there's a little Millennium Falcon. Millennium Falcon is one of the, the main ships or character ships in the film. Um, there we are. So you can see the profile of our Millennium Falcon there. Basically, anything that you can turn around, of course, we can do on the lathe. Don't have to stop at turning, though. Woodworking in general, we can play and have fun. We don't have to be serious all the time and turn bowls and goblets and gadgets and all those sorts of things. We can go um, to our Millennium Falcon or our R2-D2 or... And I don't know whether Jason's primed and ready for this one. If we go outside of the Star Wars universe to other movies out there, we could go to things like um, the Enterprise, for instance, in Star Trek. Have you got that picture of the, the Enterprise? I've just caught him unawares there. But you can pretty much do anything you want to. And I've got a couple of pictures just looking at the Enterprise from Star Trek. There's one. So that's a painted version using some um, acrylic for... Um, in the engines and the little radar dish at the front there. Um, so some of the acrylics. And then unpainted using um, some plywood. You get some great effects with, with ply. Now, you don't have to go detailed. You can you can make them pretty much very abstract. These characters, these ships, are so strong um, in, um, in sci-fi that, you know, you just make them resemble it. Everybody knows what you've made. So there we are. But today, of course, we're going to play... Um, with a little bit of turning and R2-D2. So I first made one of these for my young nephew, who is not quite so young anymore. He's now actually working in our um, uh, engineering, so making chucks and centers. So Ryan, he'll be pleased to, um, to know that I've mentioned him. Um, but we made this together for one of his birthday presents. That was he'd had a little maker's day. We made an R2-D2 lamp for him. So I thought, well, why not share that on May the 4th? It'd be perfect. Um, little project for what we're doing. So there's a couple of little um, things to turn, or three things in total. So we've got the main body, fairly easy. You can see how that's turned. And then both the, the legs here, these are all turned on the lathe, and we're going to turn them from flat section as opposed to turning them in um, uh, with, with glue chucking. And we'll turn them in flat, so I'll show you how to do that. And then, of course, we'll drill a hole through the middle. Um, it's only a short distance here, so you could use a pillar drill, um, but I'm using the long hole bore. Um, to do this one and then of course if you want to you've got these little um, these little sections here both on the front and on the side and it all de always depends on how involved you want to get on your model making this is very abstract there's not a lot um, of similarities apart from the main shape I've tried to take some of the paintwork away but you know it's quite an abstract piece if you want it to be very detailed then you can you go online and you can get the plans well not the plans so much but pictures um and and you can really spend a lot of time both on the the making of all these little sections or on the actual painting and decorating of them as well so like i said be as as detailed or undetailed as you want to so let's start let's get rid of some of these we'll keep referring back to them as we go through um one thing I would say in terms of decorating, and if I go back to the Millennium Falcon here, use anything and everything that's around you. Just go um, above there, Jace, just on this one. So this one here, this is quite a nice. This is the engines of our Millennium Falcon. I've used it also on R2-D2 as a bit of decoration, but this material here is actual abrasive. You've seen it before, the abrasive that you can get, which has the perforations in it. So I've got these sections here, but they're, they're really, really lend themselves perfectly um, for that sort of um, that sort of textured surface, just cut to size and, and away you go. I've used them on our R2-D2 just on the legs, just to give me a little bit of different texture. Um, like I say, not staying strictly to the, the actual design, but 
Um, just gives me a little bit more sort of metallic feel. So we'll start with the, the round section of our R2. Um, and we're going to use a little bit of tulip wood here. So a decent section. This is a, a four inch block or 100 by 100. Um, and total length of this one um, is 180 long. So 180 millimeters by 100 by 100. Okay, so it's easy just to take a picture from the internet and scale up or scale down to suit as you want to. Um, but I've sort of tried to go fairly big because, you know, it's going to be a bedside lamp. So I wanted to um, have some substance to it because I was quite aware that if we go too small, the feet wouldn't allow it to um, be stable. However, saying that, you know, you could make your model and put it on a baseboard. Just attach it to a baseboard and you'll be fine. So it's nice and simple to start with. We are going to have dust extraction going through a lot of this because we're doing some fairly big lumps. Um, lay speed to zero, turn the machine on. I've already checked that nothing's touching the tool rest. And this is very much basic turning to start with. We've got a big lump of 100 mil square there. And we're going to use a roughing gouge to start us off. There we are. So that's running at 1500 revs. And just nice and gentle. So just be gentle. When you've got those big vicious corners, if you take a big cut, the potential is that you'll split those corners away. So just take it nice and steady. Okay, we'll just have a stop there. I'm just going to check for, for round. I can feel a lot of flats at the moment. Look, so we'll, we'll adjust the tool rest while we get it. And this is quite a nice project for for um, for children to, to have a go with, supervised, of course. Um, it's an easy project to do. It's not too difficult. Um, as you can see here, this is literally roughing down. We're going to just do a dome on one side, flatten off the other, and, and pretty much it's done then. Ben's got a question. So we've got Ben on the questions. We've got Jason on the cameras today. So I ask as many questions. Make Ben work today. Yes, Ben. So we've got a couple of comments here. Old Faithful says that's not the droid he's looking for. <laughs> Very uh, good. It's an insider joke, that one, if you don't watch Star Wars. Maria says, help me, Colin Wong Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're my only hope. And then what else have we got here? Um... Who's the Chewy in the Axe team? Who's Chewbacca? It's Chewbacca. Oh, it has to be Ben, I think. <laughs> uh. Honestly, if you're not into Star Wars, you're, everything's going straight over your head at the moment. Ben, tell us a Star Wars joke. So I've got a good joke here. It's um Um How does Oh god, you got on it. How did Luke Skywalker know what Darth Vader got him for Christmas? We'll leave that guy to you in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to measure, first of all, the, the top of the top of our R2-D2 is a perfect sphere. So what I'm going to do is just measure the diameter, and then we'll measure half that distance back so we can turn that sphere um, in the top end. So we know it's 100 mil, so if I go 50 mil back and draw a line... That's going to be now my dome for the top. So we'll go with the bowl gouge on that. It literally is just turning a, a convex curve.
Now, of course, if you want to, you can drill the hole first. So I've just chosen not to do that on this one because it's such a short distance. I'm not worried about going off center or anything like that. A little bit flat on the top, so come right back to the line. There we go. As close to the center as I can get without touching it, that'll do. Because in a moment, we're going to um, actually put a different center in here, a single point in center, that, so we can turn right up to that uh, um, to that hole, or what will be a hole in a second. But we're starting to get somewhere now. We're starting to look sort of remotely like the um, the, the top of our R2-D2. There's still a little bit down the bottom to do. And again, if we go back to the one that we've made here, if you look down at this section, we've got a little... If you go overhead, Jace. We've got a little chamfer out here, but this chamfer is just, it's not just a straight chamfer. There's actually a line cut in first. So we're going to do that with a parting tool and then cut away. So, and I'm not measuring that. Uh, to be quite honest, there's only so much we need to, you know, really, really measure and be accurate with, unless you're trying to make a, a replica. So just, again, just using the bowl gouge. But what I'm going to do once we've got the main shape done is now use the skew. You know, there's always going to be a, a place for the, for the signature skew. So we're going to use the skew just to go right up to that flat face. There we are. So we've got no flat at all. We've just got this nice little cut um, recess there, look. Okay, next thing, we're just going to very gently cut a true face. And when you're using the parting tool, if you're cutting a long way, if you just cut down using the tip of the tool, you'll get quite a rough finish. So if you can put a little bit of pressure, um, I don't know whether I can show you this, a little bit of pressure on this surface here. So the actual side of the parting tool, that will scrape as you're cutting down. And that will mean you gives you, it'll leave you a, a much better finish than just using the tip of the tool. Using that side scrape. Let's just check the finish on that underside. I'm just trying to eliminate as many of those tears as possible. I haven't cleaned this surface up. This is still from the roughing gouge. I'm just going to roughly sand it. That's all. We're not, I'm not worried too much. Um, my intention for this piece, because it's tulip, would be to paint it anyway. Um, and in terms of painting, pretty much anything. You know, this is a bedside lamp. Um, I would say certainly start with a primer uh, first, and that can be a white primer or gray primer before you go over with the, um, the, the main color, the white. And in R2's case, you've got a white um, body and you've got a silver top before you then part, start putting the detail on, the blues and, and, uh, and blacks and things like that. That's pretty much where we are at the moment. So all I'm going to do now is put the hole up through the center and then re-hold it between centers to clean up either end before we start sanding. So there's a little bit of work to do before we do that. And then, of course, we've got to join this together. This is going to be held together with a couple of bits of dowel. Um, in this case, I've got 18 mil dowel, and it's perfect for this sort of thing. Um, that little round section, both holding the body and the arms together, just look right for, the, for, for R2. So 18 mil, bought dowel. I didn't make it, but you could turn your own, I guess. And this is beach dowel, this one. So let's get the, the hole up through the middle. Now, the, today was going to be, before I realized what today was in terms of the 4th of uh, May the 4th, 
before I realized that, I was going to do a whole section on long hole boring. Now, unfortunately, they've been really, really popular. So we're out of stock of all the long hole boring bits and bobs. So I'm not going to elaborate hugely on that. I will do that in a, a couple of episodes, um, though. So maybe maybe sort of five to six weeks' time, we will look at long hole boring in, in far greater detail. But I will go through this one. If you haven't got long hole boring system, this sort of sizing, you could use a pillar drill to, to drill through as well. Uh, ben, yes. Um, would you use a sanding sealer before painting it? Right? Yeah, absolutely. This particular um, uh, project definitely needs a, a sanding sealer. If you spray directly onto bare timber, the fibers will prick up and you'll have to sand back quite heavily. It also, with sanding sealer, it's going to prevent that paint from being sucked in every time you put a coat on, especially on the end grain. And tulip wood is one of those timbers that if you just... Um, you know, paint onto bare surface, it will keep sucking it in. So you get a very, um, the, the texture of the paint will change on end grain to, to side grain if you don't. So you could even go neat sanding sealer, and it doesn't really matter what sanding sealer you use, just check, do a test patch um, on a particular paint. So if you're worried about if it's going to react with a certain paint, just do a, tech, a test patch first. Um, but this is the, the sealer I've used here is my normal cellulose based sealer, and I've then gone with an aerosol. Um, as a primer. I've done some hand painting, but I've also used some uh, paint pens as well and some airbrush acrylics um, on them and they will work fine. So we've had no issues at all there. So I'm just going to put some of the tools away. We're in quite a confined space here, but um, what with, with the cameras and all those sorts of things, because we're going to use the long hole boring system now. Um, so it's going to mean that I'm drilling up through the tailstock of the lathe. So I'm just going to make myself a little bit of room and we're going to swap out our centers. So in the tail stock, I'm going to keep this one there for the moment. So the headstock drive is going to stay the same. We will swap that in a second. But first of all, I'm just going to remove this one. And we're going to put the, the hollow live center in. So hollow live is exactly that. It's a, a center that rotates. Okay, it's got a couple of exhaust ports just to let shavings out. But in terms of the center, it's hollow all the way through. So we can we can use that uh, boring auger all the way through and get a nice hole centrally. Okay, it's fitting onto the ring of the ring center that I was using already. Slightly different. Oh, there we are. That's fitting in nicely. So that's left me now. I've got a, a, a live center supported by its outer ring. I can now send the auger all the way up through the middle until I get to just past halfway. Once I get to that point, I'll stop. We change the center on this side, flip them over, and finish the hole around. Okay. So there we are. The auger I'm using, again, excuse me, guys, this is my old handle. The handles, um, the new handles are, are out. Like I said, they've been really popular, so we're temporarily out of stock, but um, it's going to be this type of handle. The auger travels up and down through, so you can change it for the um, different size of your lamps. And all I'm doing is just going to set it to just past halfway in that project. Now, what can happen sometimes, because this timber is particularly dry, and all our tulip we get is kiln dried. Um, so what can happen, you get a little bit of friction with that. So a bit of wax, so any of your paste waxes will work. Um, apply them with a tissue. Don't be tempted to use your finger um, to put paste wax on an auger, especially when you've used it, because you'll do one of two things. You'll either cut yourself um, or you burn yourself. Okay, so a little bit of paste wax I find helps. It just stops that really loud screeching um, and just on the, the main shaft of the, of the auger. There we are. Okay, so we'll just pop a hole at this one. And I'm going to do this at about 1,200 revs. So nice and gently to start with. Make sure it goes into the, the live, and then you can start drilling. Like I say, the, the, um, the shavings will come out the exhaust in the actual live center here. You can see them sort of coming out. You just see a little bit of hear a little bit of screeching. I don't like that, so what I tend to do is get a little bit more of the wax 
And it's not too bad for you guys because of the, the microphones that we're using here. But when you're actually in the workshop, it's, it can be quite damaging noise level. So just give it a, bit, a little bit of wiggle around, wiggle around, get it into that center again. There we are. So that's now gone. Just double check that. So we're past halfway now on that bit of drilling. So I'm going to remove piece of work and we're going to swap it, this center over. So slightly different center now. It's called a counter ball. So what the counter ball does, it's the same diameter on its center pin as the hole we just drilled. There we are, little counter ball. So that will now locate into the hole that we've just drilled really, really neatly and drive that top end. And this is the reason that I haven't cleaned this end up yet. So let's get a little bit of wax there, put that on that end. That's gonna go there. Sorry, Ben, yes. Um, so I've got a question. Maria in Wales is asking, could you drill before turning if you haven't got the hollowing um, lightsaber? <laughs> yes, you can. I mean, normally, if I'm doing um, any long lamps, they, the holes will all be drilled uh, first because then you drill around the hole, and so the, the hole will always be central. Because this was so short, I didn't worry about it too much. Um, so, but, yeah, absolutely, yes, you can. There we are. There we are. We're going to drill just to meet up with the hole that we've done from the top end now. See those shavings spilling out quite nicely. There we are, and we're through. So I'm just going to give it a bit of a wig around to get rid of any shavings that might be caught up there. And we're done. We can go back nice and safe. There we are. I don't know whether you can see, go above there, Jace. If I get it in the right light, there we are. You can just see the hole running all the way down through the center, nice and central. So when we're making a lamp, my intention for this one. The, and this one isn't wired up at all yet. Um, the, the intention for this one is the wire will go all the way through and out the bottom and have no need to be diverted through the side of the thing. can just come straight down to the plug um, because that's actually stood proud off the, off the table. Um, it's not going to be an issue there at all. And the flex we're using on the plastic, um, the plastic, uh, lamp holders, the switch lamp holders here, we're using white two core flex, but on the brass ones, any metal um, switch lamp holders, then you need the three core, the three core flex. All right, so now we've got holes, we can clean up both of the hold points. Okay, so we can take out the drive center from there. We don't need all that, that power now to drive the piece. So we'll pop him back there and let's go. I need a single pointed center and what better than to have a, a light pool drive or any just single pointed drive center that you might have. Um, and in the other end, we use a, a standard 90 degree center there. Look, look at that. So then we've got a nice point. Let's turn him around that way. Yes, Ben. So a question from Cliff. Um, what are the advantages of using the hollow boring versus using a drill uh, via, via the chuck? So there's a couple of things really. If you're so if you're doing a lot of lamps, and if you're doing lamps much bigger than this, um, it, it's best to go with an auger purely because it stays on center. Um, imagine doing standard lamps, that sort of thing. You need to have that um, that accurate central um, drilling. A short piece like this, you can get away with using um, a drill bit on the lathe. Just be aware that twist drills. As soon as you go below a certain size, we'll start to wander and, and wave around a little bit because there's nothing supporting that timber, stopping that timber from moving. Um, when the actual timber's moving and your drill is staying still, it's a little bit easier to, to follow, especially when you're being guided by that hollow um, tailstock center. Um, so for anything much bigger than this, I'd always go and auger. Um, but like I say, you get away with it if you're on short distances. All right, that's the only reason, really. 
Right, let's clean that end up. If you're finding or struggling to get that to grip, then you can just put a normal drive center on one side, sort out the, the waste, turn them over, and do the same thing. I should have enough grip from that. We'll soon find out. If not, we, uh, we can soon change it, if not. So I'll use the skew for this. It's the best tool because it's nice and fine. Skew chisel, da 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 da. Let's go with. I'll go with the small twelve mil. You see, all we're doing is literally just shaving off the the hold area. It will become loose there, so we just tighten up. Because you're taking timber away from the length, of course, and where you're pinching between centers take timber away then it's going to loosen it so there we are another little tidying cut just using the tip of the skew there we are once you've done that stop the lathe turn it over and clean up the other side depends on whether you're left or right-handed which to which you're going to find easiest i'm right-handed so i'm using the tailstock end as my working area we are same thing here. And there we are, and that'll do us. Now, one little tip: it's not something something I'm working on for for, for selling um, with these uh, lamp making bits is a um, uh, a tap that you can use for the brass nipples that go inside here. At the moment, all I've been doing is just tapping them in. They hold really soundly. But if you can get a tap in there, and I use one, um, one at home, which is an imperial tap, which taps the same thread as the little brass nipple that we've got in the top. Alternatively, what you can do with these, so there's the brass nipple in the top there. What you can do is you get a little brass plate instead, and the brass plate is the same thread size that that then threads into our, our lamp holder. Um, uh, again, Lily, I think you have all of those part numbers there. Um, I don't have one here to show you, but basically just a brass uh, a brass plate if you'd rather go that way, okay? So let's just do a little bit of sanding. I'm not gonna go crazy with the sanding. Um, got a dust extractor here, but you don't need to see me sand, just you would now not naturally sand. So just a little bit of sanding. I'm just gonna go 100, 150, 240. Okay, uh, and best to stay uh, that sort of level if you're going to paint over the top. You don't need to worry about getting rid of scratches. Um, you don't want to have a glossy finish, so you don't need to go to 400 to 600, that sort of thing. You want a good um, key for that paint to grip. So 240 would be fine just to stop at. So there we are. Let's go half decent speed. Dust extraction is going on. Starting at a, a, a 100 grit. Because I'm working between a just a friction drive and a fairly small friction drive at that, you know, occasionally it's going to slow down if I press too hard. So it's a good bit of discipline for me to not press too hard. Speed can come up a little bit as well. do for us for the minute. And 150. This is quite an important face, this dome top, that you're going to have a lot of detail on this um, and you don't want the paint being absorbed heavily in one place.
There we are. 240. There we are. That'll do us now. Unlike normal turning, you know, you're going to be faced with a few scratches here. Don't let that worry you. Doesn't make any difference. It's going to be painted over the top. Sanding sealer next, though. So I've got my jar of ready made sanding sealer just here. And we can properly, properly coat this in a bit of sealer. So that question earlier, you know, do we seal it? Yes, we seal it well. Um, we'll wipe off any excess as well. This is really going to help your painting later on. There we are. By the time I've put the lid on the sealer, that would dry would have dried enough for me to then wipe off the excess. You know, it's soaked in far enough by now. I can smell that it's evaporating. It's, uh, I can see the color change. Ideally now, if you left that probably about five to 10 minutes and then just denib, so all those fibers that are rising up, because that's a wet solution, just denib. Don't turn the lathe on yet. So don't, I wouldn't turn the lathe on now because there was a heavy amount of sealer that I put on that. It will just, like a sponge, release that sealer back out toward me. Um, so I wouldn't turn the lathe on just yet on that one. Okay, let's take that one off. That's all of the turning done on that particular piece. Oh, I say all the turning. I'm going to put a couple of lines in this because that's going to help me with my painting. It's also going to help me with my drilling in a minute. So let's just give it five seconds. Get that tool rest back on. Again, let's just have a look at what we've done already and talk about how we can... Oh, yes, Ben, what's the question? So a question from Donna, um, what do you thin the cellulose sealer with? So um, cellulose uh, thinners, so I tend to use the same make. So we've got, uh, in this case, it's chestnut. So cellulose sanding sealer and cellulose thinners. Um, and you, you manufacturer says don't thin it. And in this case, you can do it unthin. So anything that way you want to harden the timber up, that sort of thing, then absolutely. I tend to go with a thin version. So I'll say 50% maximum um, uh, with the thinners purely because then it can soak in a lot further. Uh, you might have to put a couple of coats on, but it will soak in a lot further, especially those really dense exotic timbers and the ones that are waxy. It'll eat through those waxes going a long way and really benefit the turning. That's drying nicely now. I can feel the nap, that grain uh, come up. Ben, yes. And then just something I missed from earlier, um, KJ Carpentry says, surely Colin's chewy as he's a skew backer. Oh, very good. See what you've done there. Well done. <laughs> uh, look, we've got some lines in here. Um, these lines have helped for the painting. This, the silver, by the way, is paint pens. I, I do use a lot of paint pens, and and on the lathe, it makes sense to use the, mo the motion of the lathe to, to create these nice crisp lines. But I put two little beaded lines here, here <coughs> excuse me, down here, one here, and one right up the top, just to give us a nice defining line between these areas so i'm going to put those in because they're going to help me position the holes for the the arms so that's dried nicely so once i finish putting these lines in i'm just going to very lightly denib that so here goes Turn that lay speed down just a little bit There we are. So the top ones, I can you you don't have to cut these by slicing. You can see there that all I'm doing is using the tip of the skew 
just to give me a nice little fine scrape. Okay, so we've got our lines. Whilst that's there, let's give it a very, very fine sand. So you, when it comes to denimming, you don't need to go um, too, or you don't want to go too um, coarse at all. This is this is a 400, 400 or 600 to denib. You're not trying to sand the whole surface off again. You're just making or taking those fibers away that have stood up with the sealer. There we are. That's fine. So that's pretty much all the turning finished on that one. We just need to drill them out now. So I'm just going to make a couple of measurements. And we're going to come, let me hold, let me hold our body in here. This is a little sled that I've made. So this little sled is just simple, a couple of bits of timber, um, sandwiching a bit of, a uh, bit of 25 mil stock. Um, instead of making a V-block, I'm using that to hold the piece on the drill when I'm drilling. Yes, Ben, another question. So a question from Malcolm. Um, he says he sprays on the sealer with a couple of light coats and it's instantly dry. Um, is there an advantage of painting it on with the brush and then wiping off the excess? Um, not really. Um, it's my preference. I prefer to do it that way. Um, I, I just feel I'm at more control in the thinning stages, that's all. Um, and like I said, if it's a really exotic or dense material, I want to get really lathered on and let it absorb its way in. That, that's the only reason. Um, I, I've always done it that way, so I, I sort of stayed the same. Okay, so that's my drill hole on one side. It's not really, really accurate, so don't worry about trying to get exactly in the opposite position. Eyeball it, that's all. So I'm going to eyeball it there's my position and i'm coming down the same amount 20 mil um from the that line that i've made so this is supposed to be a bit of fun there's no head scratching going on here at all just made that mark in the same place um, if you want a, a position for the drill bit to locate into put yourself a little brattle mark in Okay, so that gives a, a proper, um, a nice secure area to drill. So let's go over to the drill. So I'm just going to bring that drill up a little bit. I'm actually going to use the depth of the drill as a guide. So I want to make sure that we're nicely lined up that way. So I'm lining up this way in my little block here, but then I'm bringing it back around to eyeball the 20 mil from that line. So I know that I'll be absolutely crisp there. Okay, looking good. So just a nice, I don't know if you go too deep. Take your time. do and again if that one can come out now we're going to line them up in the same way we'll turn them over make sure that your line is central this way in the actual carrier here then turn them around get rid of some of that muck so i can see the point that's what i'm trying to do i want to line my point up with that little bridle mark there we are, we're in the right position. So same again, no stress, pressure or anything like that, just take my time. Because we've, we're holding our round piece of stock in a sled, it's really secure. It's not gonna skid and fall around anywhere. I'm taking my time and out again. Okay, so that is then ready. We're going to use that one again just as a bit of a height block in a moment, but that's our droid top all ready to go. In terms of the in terms of the dowel, I've just cut a couple of little sections like that. And then that can get popped in 
I won't do it just yet, but just with a little hammer, just tap that one in and we're good to go. All right, so let's move on. That was nice and easy. Let's move on to our arms or feet, legs. There we are. That's what we've got. So you can see there, I, again, I'll give you dimensions. So this is out of a block. I've oversized the block. So we've got oh, just over 80, about 83. The widest part of this arm is going to be 75. So 75 is 3-inch square. You could do quite easily. And in terms of length, I'm going to take a little bit off the top just to get rid of any holding marks. He's 150, 6 inches long at the moment. Okay. And it's really important that you mark where you're going to go. So templates. Okay. That's my leg. Okay, all I've done, again, is take a, an image off of um, the internet, inscribed around it, and then transfer that to a piece of, of plywood. That's really important to get this the same. Over the top, don't use a pencil, use a felt tip, something really dark, so you can see the markings there. Because we're actually going to turn to those markings with the, with the lathe running. So I'm hoping that the camera's going to pick this up and, and show you or let you see what I can see. So we're going to swap that one out, that center. He's going to um, come out for a little pro drive. So the 16 mil pro drive is going to go in now. There we are. So that's, that's that one. Um, Telstock center, I'm going to go with a ring center. Okay, and let's pop the pro drive on the bigger end. Make sure you get them in the right place. It's quite important here that center is actually center of your marked area. Otherwise, you won't follow that black line because it'll be off too much. So let's see if the camera picks that up a minute. There we are. Certain speeds, that camera's picking that up lovely. I can see it crisp as if it has stopped. So I'm going to turn to that profile now. I want it going fairly quickly. So I'm there turning at 1600 revs. Now that's better. You can see that. So let's turn the machine off just so I can get my tool rest in position. Knuckles out the way of this one. You could, of course, just get your bandsaw. If you have a bandsaw, cut it to shape. Yes, Ben? What was the drill size on the auger? Drill, it was 18 mil. Um, oh, sorry, on the auger. Uh, five, the, the, I think it's still five sixteenths. Let me just double check, which is an old, old size. It might have changed the metric now. Eight millimeters, sorry, eight mil. So I think I think it was the um on what's on the pillar drill. Oh, on the pillar drill, the pillar drill was eighteen millimeters. Um, but be, to be quite honest, you go with you use the drill size to the dowel that you can get. I got eighteen mil dowel, so an eighteen mil drill bit. Okay, but if you can only get twenty, do the same. If you can only get fifteen or sixteen, do the same. And then a question from Cliff: Why choose those particular pro drive and live center? Um, I find them easier to work with because the pro drives have a sprung center. I'm not having to fill around with tapping things in, you know, like four prong drive, two prong drives, you have to tap things in, um, with these you don't. So for me, I find them, they've really saved me a massive amount of time since, since I've started using them. Um, and they're my go-to drive centers now over, over four prong drives. I find they don't clog up as quickly. They're a better drive. They're a little bit more accurate as well. So that's, that's why I use them. So, right, we've got a big square bit of timber. Like I said, take some of it off on the bandsaw if you want to first. But I'll just show you. We'll go with a, um, a 3 8 bowl gouge. Let's just take some of this square away. And I'm cutting to the profile that I can see. That felt tip mark. And we've done something like this. We've done something like this a few weeks ago when we were doing the, um, the spatulas.
So I'm just looking at the felt tip line. So let's start cutting right up close to the line now. We are actually going to sand these, these radius edges flat in many cases. One step there, the next step, next step. Let's just stop and just have a look and see what we got. I'm going to square a few things up with the skew. Um, the skew as a scraper, we might as well. You can see the, the felt tip mark there, so we haven't done too bad. So anywhere that you want it nice and crisp, the skew makes a lovely negative rake scraper. should be pretty much it. Now, I don't need to sand this because we're going to sand it separately on the disc sander. The only bit we won't touch are these inner sections here. So maybe just a little bit of coarse. Keep your fingers nice and clear. Probably dust extraction on whilst I'm doing this. Remember, we're going to paint this quite heavily, so I don't need to worry too much. Okay, so I think you can see where we're going with this. I won't bother with the second one. You can see it's just a replica of what I've just done there. So there you can just see our, our felt tip mark. We've turned to those. But now we can improve this. If we now sand on our disc sander back to the profile even more, just to get rid of um, this this radius edge where we can. We don't have to do it all over. I'm not going to be able to get inside here. You could file that. You could use a, a, another device um, to do that hand file or something. But I'm just going to work on the areas I can get to um, just to show you a way around. So we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, we're going to take out our centers. Let's take this one away. Come right out of the way from it. I don't need that. I'm going to put my chuck back on. So the SK114 with the C jaws. And you know what's coming the sanding disc. Sanding disc, as you all know, we're using the faceplate ring on the back.
And then we're going to use our little sanding table. So with the carving carving plate attached to the, the Evolution um, tool post, and then I've put a little, um, uh, a little collar on here. You can set that for halfway, or on this one, I actually want to be below halfway. Um, so I need to have, I think I've set that up already. I need to have... The center point. So let's me let me just find center for you a minute. So there's the center, and put a pencil mark there. So I need to have the center point on the halfway point, okay, of this turning here. So center point it's already set to this point for me. So basically, you measure your width, and then that's how far or half that width below center with the top of your table. Just to make it easier for sanding, we need to have the center point of our project piece on the center point of the sanding disc. So we're nice and close. Make sure nothing's touching that table. We're definitely gonna have the extractor on. You're just going to sand around up to your felt tip line. Don't worry, when you get to that point, I can't quite get to that area there. When we get to that point, you go ahead. Yeah? When we get to that point, if I carry on coming around, of course, I'm going to start hitting this area. It doesn't matter, you can still flip it because now. We're just sanding to the, the top of your corner up here. So you can still see exactly where you have to sand to. So we've got flat edges, flat edges around where we can get to, around this sort of area. But what I want to do also is just put a couple of little steps where these lines are. And again, if I take this one, we'll just quickly show you the one that we finished already. You can see that we've put a little bit of a profile on there. So it's not just a flat surface. There are little little steps to catch the, um, catch the shadow. Um, and we just turn the leg on its side Anyway, you can start to see the profile start to creep out. So it's just creating a little shadow line. That's all we're doing. Okay. Yes, Ben, any questions? So question from David. Uh, which is the preferred material for the sanding disc, plywood or MDF? Uh, well, I would always go plywood. It's a little bit harder. It doesn't delaminate as quickly. Um, you know, the, the edge is a little bit harder as well. I've tapered the back of this one for this very job. This is what sort of thing you can sand around it. It's just, it'll last you longer. It doesn't turn um, bow warp around. Like I say, the delamination in MDF sometimes can be a bit of a pain. It's a softer edge. So plywood for me. Yes. And then Charlie's asking how many you've turned. How many? R2s. R2, oh, not many. No, this is probably my fourth. All right, so like I say, Ryan was my, uh, my guinea pig probably around about 10 years ago now. Um, he came up for a birthday present to do some turning, and we turn in the R2 lamp. 
And then Simon's asking, why does the centre of the sanding disc need to be lined up with the centre of the piece? So really, just to give me a nice flat, when 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 I'm starting to raise it like this, I don't want to have, you think we've got to work centrally to the radius if I'm on a table. That's what I'm trying to say. If I'm trying to work up here, as the, the angle of the disc comes around, I'll cut instead of a nice straight edge here, it'll be an angle. Um, to that to, to that sanding area that's the only reason um you could sound centrally and just then you'll have to sort of you know tilt the piece up but it's just to keep this nice and straight basically right so we're going to do one more thing now and that's drill the hole in our leg obviously you're going to have to do two of these i'm just going to do one for you today and i'm using that little sled that i made to hold the body just as a a bed here so we need to do some markings so let's get my rule so let's say sure there's the 40 it's an 18 mil drill bit so we've got to be in a position that that's going to be nice and central so again if i put a little next for you there and we will go with a brattle mark just easier to center up on a mark a brattle mark than a just a pencil line there we are you don't want to go all the way through so make sure you don't you can set your stop on your your pillar drill i'm just going to go to the shoulder of the actual drill bit so that's going to be my mark feed the drill bit in There we are, up to that shoulder. Okay, so we've got a nice little central hole ready to be joined together. So let's just, I'm just going to do a little bit of assembly for you. If we come back to the lathe, um, a little nylon mallet. Obviously, you won't do this at this stage. You want to make sure you get painted first. Droid's going to be moving around in circles for a little while. Well, there we are. Again, just give them another clout. I would put a little bit of sacrificial timber on here before you start clouting this because even a nylon mallet will, mallet will damage the timber here. Um, make sure you paint everything separately. So don't put it together and then 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 um, go to paint. You want to paint every item separately. Um, you'll get much, much crisper edges and the ease of being, uh, you know, painting both sides. Um, far outweighs the excitement of putting it together, you know, prematurely. Let's just do one more thing before we finish. I'm just going to turn a couple of these little um, little bits of detail on the top of R2's um, dome. I nearly said head, um, but dome. And you can use pretty much anything. Let's use a bit of a bit of dow. Chase, would you grab that bit of timber there that I left conveniently? Thank you. So we're just going to use a little bit of tulip. Very, very simple procedure, this one. This is literally just whatever shape you want it to be. But we're going to do, I guess it's a little ewer of some sort. Yes, Ben, was that a question? Um, yeah, so Maria's asking, um, could you do a BB-8 as well? But she supposes Star Wars Day is over then. A BB-8 would be an easy one to do, wouldn't it? It's a, a, a nice little sphere, or a, a half sphere on top of a sphere. I mean, as makers, we're naturally, we're naturally bred, we're naturally designed to like Star Wars and all these sci-fi things anyway. So, um, you know what we're talking about when we talk about BB-8 and R2-D2. There we are, just using a pet set of little pin jaws. Keep your fingers out of the way when you're using these. Again, let's go for a smaller tool rest. This is screams skew chisel. So let's go for our little 12 mil skew. Rough it down to a cylinder first. And 
and then we're just going to do one of these little viewers. Little parting tool, let's just put a, a, a finish line there and then parting tool. So the only reason I put that line is so sometimes when the parting tool goes in to start with it, I throw up a little burr. So a little cut line there just stops that burr from forming. There we are, we know where we're going to finish. Don't make the back of this flat. I'm just angling that parting tool in at a nice angle, just so it'll give me a, a cup on the inside, a little concave cup. There we are. Now we do need to work on taking this little area away here. Um, and what I tend to do, I've got a little rotary machine that I just pair that off with, but a little carving knife, keeping your fingers away. Sand it away with the sanding disc. In fact, just whilst I've got the disc out. Yes, Ben. So Chris has asked, um, if you'd be interested in seeing the actual light assembly and um, brass plate insertion for the lamp hold in the future. Say that again, sorry. Um, Chris is saying he'd like to see how the brass plate was um, inserted. Could that be one for the future? I think what we'll do, Chris, so I want to do some long hole boring. So we'll make a two part lamp. Um, when I've got it, the, the stuff back in stock, um, we'll get the lamp going. We'll do a nice base. We'll do a, a freestanding lamp on top of that. And then we're, we're, we're drill it out. We'll put a plate on the top. We can feed it through and we can show you all the, all the bits and bobs that's involved with lamp making. I think that'd be a, a good little session. That one, like I say today, I, I did intend to do some long hole boring today, but knowing what the stock levels were like, um, everybody's liking it out there. So, uh, I held off, but yes, absolutely. In the future, we will be doing that. So where are we? What lamp? So there we are. That's one of his little little viewers. A little bit further down. Okay. Very iconic with that that uh, that figure, that R2D2 figure. Okay. Right. Any questions, Ben? I think we're right about out of time now. We'll finish up with our R2 in shot. Um, so Woodwork Learner's asking, uh, would you use the force if you didn't have a small skew chisel? Absolutely. What better alternative than a Coleman Way skew is the force? <laughs> a lot of shaking heads behind the camera. Here. Guys, thank you ever so much for this bit of fun we've had. Enjoy the rest of uh, May the 4th. And, uh, yeah, well, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. May the force be with you. Bye-bye.